waking and dreaming. Despite all the chaos and disruption within the world and society at large, they are but the birth pangs of a higher level of complexity beyond our ability to see. If we could but see it for what it is, then we would already be within it. Like a hypercube, we can only see its shadow. When we perceive things outside of our cognitive ability to structure internally, we can't comprehend them. As McKenna reasoned, we are being drawn by a teleological attractor at the end of time. During his time, Freud considered there to be three great scientific revolutions that completely shattered the egocentrism of human reality. Firstly, the Copernican Revolution, where the Ptolemaic perspective of the cosmos was replaced by the heliocentric model, where people were shown that the Earth was no longer the centre of the cosmos. Next, according to Freud, came the Darwinian Revolution, whereby humans were reduced to merely the hairless descendants of apes. Finally, the psychological revolution, whereby humans were told they are not even in control of their own behaviour. So what could the next great revolution be? Quantum mechanics and interdisciplinary sciences are only part of this culminating change. The revival of shamanic traditions is another. So is the influence of Gnosticism in popular culture, as is embodied cognition and speculative realism and post-structuralism, as is visionary art and lucid dreaming, virtual reality and alternative reality games, so is the open source movement and peer-to-peer -peer and, and digital socialism, which of course is all part of McLuhan's global theatre, and on it goes. Nothing less than the integration and reorganisation of every system that precedes it, a shift in perspectives that reverberates throughout every era of human activity, what McKenna described as an ingression of novelty, what Alfred North Whitehead called concrescence, what Marvin Minsky called society of mind. We can liken the information age to the growth of neurons, beyond which lies the developing superorganism of the new sphere, the global brain of the simulation age of planetary civilization. The long tentacles of commerce, communication and culture are weaving nations and regions into a single planetary fabric. The boundaries of the self are being dissolved. What we are moving into is a geometric model of consciousness and a pluralized, holonic and interrelational sense of self, a transcendent self. Ultimately, when our sense of self is changed, so is our worldview and indeed our entire reality. More than anything else, the 21st century will redefine what it means to be human. That is, of course, if we do not annihilate ourselves beforehand. Yet death and destruction of the old is also part of the birthing of this new creation. The historical tirade of objectivity and determinism are woven into our very self-definition. Therefore, the movement to a new reality of the self will encompass the death of much that is familiar just as an unborn child must leave the familiar yet imploding womb and venture into the unknown in order to live. We can no longer cling to our outdated ideologies pretending this is not happening. Will we emerge from under the hubris of our civilization or forever entomb ourselves in a sterile wasteland? The longer we deny the changes, the more psychologically damaging the current world becomes. We need to be able to enter into a participatory relationship with that which we seek to know and not keep it ultimately distanced as an object. The creation of this new self ultimately involves reintroducing the unconscious to the conscious. Instead of projecting the shadow onto the world, we must integrate it to heal ourselves. Lynn White Jr. wrote, The religious problem now is to find a viable alternative to animism. Alan Watts said, We do not need a new religion or a new Bible. We need a new experience, a new feeling of what it is to be I. The current eschatological unfoldment is more than just the integration of supposedly different subjects, it also involves dismantling perceptual dualism, the realisation that ontologically psyche and soma are one reality, body and mind invariably go together. As William Blake said, the notion that man has a body distinct from his soul is to be expunged. Just as Plotinus said, those who would find an other world apart from this world have missed the point. Spirit and soul are everywhere and nowhere, heaven and hell, samsara and nirvana are one reality. Einstein, when asked what he thought was the single most important question that humanity could ask itself, replied, Is the universe friendly? Any metaphysical system that views all natural objects as endowed with mind-like qualities has clear implications for our attitude towards each other and the world around us. There are no discrete objects in the universe, things only exist in relation to each other. Likewise, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution has proven itself to be at best incomplete and at worst fundamentally flawed. It is beyond the scope of this work to fully get into this debate. What is relevant to say here is, contrary to Darwin's idea of competition between species, different species seek to develop a symbiotic, i.e. cooperative relationship between each other in order to maximize their survival. Species do not evolve, they co-evolve. For example, it can be demonstrated that ecosystems are more stable and negantropic, i.e. life-affirming, when they are able to maintain maximum diversity. 
Relationships are the foundation of everything, from the subatomic to the cellular, from the ecological to the social and beyond. Thomas Berry said, We are moving from a world seen as a collection of objects to a world recognised as a communion of subjects. The most destructive aspect of Darwin's ideas is that they became part of the foundation of social Darwinism, which brought the notion of survival of the fittest into society. This of course birthed the eugenics movement, and now today we have its modern counterpart in the form of transhumanism. The notion of life as a struggle has long been an implicit part of our worldview. We are conditioned from a young age to compete for our very sense of self, to be an individual distinct from others. Nowhere is this sense of struggle to survive most prevalent than within our economic system. How we work and do business depends upon where we draw the line between self and other, our social ecology. When do negative externalities become internalized costs? Furthermore, our notion of security depends on being able to compete with others because of artificial needs and scarcity. More for me is less for you. However, this is entirely unnatural and counterintuitive. As Eric Fromm noted, only a fundamental change in human character from a preponderance of having to a state of beingness can save us from catastrophe. Furthermore, he said, man is phylogenically a non-predatory animal. Security can only come through giving and opening to the web of relationships. As John Donne said, no man is an island. Mark Chatterton has lived for over two years without spending any money. When asked what he has learned from his experience, he replied that friendship, not money, is the real security. Tom Brown Jr. remarked, prosperity is relating, not acquiring. The way that objects interact is fundamentally aesthetic. Just as hot meets cold, dry meets wet, and hard meets soft, they inform each other with their essence similar in some sense to Isaac Newton's third law of motion that states for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. This aesthetic essence of relationship is what some would call spirit. I prefer to call it information. No physical system can exist without information. It is what water is to fish and what air is to birds. It escapes your rational mind just as your face cannot see itself or your hand cannot hold itself. It is the intimate dimension between self and other the anima mundi, where experience and experiencer become one experiencing, known and knower, one knowing. Any vision we may hope to imbue within our society, our world, I suggest must come from the aesthetic, from the imaginal. Fyodor Dostoyevsky said, beauty will save the world. John Lamb Lash remarked, without vision the people die, without awe we lack the humility to live and the strength to protect what we love. Jung believed that the psyche had the same qualities that the natural world once had. It was his endeavour to rescue natural divinity and bring meaning back to mankind, of which he inevitably failed. As Sonno Sandesini and Wolfgang Geigerich have suggested, the true nature of the psyche is a fabricated reality, not in the sense of a lie, but in the sense of a reality that simulates positive reality. Therefore the psyche has to be seen as a story, yet we cannot see it as such when we are embedded within it. As Geigerich recounts, despite his literal biological birth, man has logically never left the inness of the womb, the spiritual womb, the amniotic sac of the mind, images and meanings that stand irrevocably between him and external reality. Much like within a dream, we identify with the dream ego rather than the waking ego. What appears to be happening is we are logically falling out of our containment in language, waking up from our own dream. The psyche appears to be evolving towards a simulated reality so that it may fully know itself. As Levy elegantly said, the universe is dreaming itself awake. This is what McKenna described as the internalization of the body and the exteriorization of the soul, so that we may become a, quote, superconducting lens of translinguistic matter, end quote. That is not to suggest that we will all merge into undifferentiated oneness. The discrete and separate self will not disappear, but will become more fluid and no longer a permanent irrevocable feature of our reality. McLuhan described a trend which he termed the cooling of media, which in approximation means that the media is becoming more participatory. For example, a book is what McLuhan described as hot, whereas TV would be cool. McLuhan's main argument being that technologies affect our cognitive process and therefore our social organization, that media is an extension of ourselves. Geigeri adds that television had the role of establishing simulation as the new form of truth and reality. What is simulation? It is mere appearance as an end unto itself. TV has already brought about huge transformations within society, everything from the Apollo 11 moon landing to the war in Iraq. 
Not only is the media changing the way people communicate with each other, it's also changing the way we think. Research has shown, for example,